Welcome everyone to CG seminar number 200 and webinar number 68 in succession in this format. It's a great pleasure to, um, to hold this webinar today because we talk about higher education research and the media. And we have a great group of journalists and a former journalist to discuss those things with us. Uh, I'm going to introduce the speakers as we go through. We have six speakers, but um, let me tell you that this is an extended webinar. We don't usually do this, but today we thought for the 200th, we'd allow ourselves to go to 90 minutes so we can have a decent Q&A uh, after hearing a decent number of speakers. Um, let me take you through the webinar protocols. Well, the webinar is being recorded as they all are and will be posted online on the CG website within 48 hours. And you'll be able to watch this on YouTube for the duration of time. Um, the chat function will also be posted on our, web, on our website as well. Now, please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or and you're asking your question. Um, and there's no need to have your video on during the webinar either, but please turn it on when you're asking a question. It makes it more fun. We recommend using this speaker view setting in Zoom so you can more clearly see who is talking. To ask a question, and I'm sure there'll be lots of people wanting to do so, use the chat function. Put your question or your statement in the chat function and I'll select from what's there to constitute the Q&A once our sixth speaker has finished. Uh, good idea to come in early we have great questions coming in late in webinars that we can't use uh but uh if you come in early you're very likely to end up in that q a um when you are invited to ask your question please unmute yourself switch on your video and then start by stating your name and where you are from well universities research the media um we cannot really overstate the importance of media and journalism, professional journalism to public policy, to po politics and to higher education and research. Uh, many respects, what the media does constitutes the public space that we all inhabit. And it plays a crucial role between social sectors like ours and, po and politics and government. In many respects, constituting public issues, but not all, always so, and of course, government itself, the state, a major initiator, and sometimes issues are created from below. So it's in that interaction between government uh, and what's bubbling up from below that the media has such a, a huge role. But um, the role of traditional media, which still constitutes the issues in many ways, um, is now supplemented and in somewhat, somewhat overtaken at times by social media, direct communication, um, through uh, through the web and uh, you know through the mechanisms of communication, and um, the the relationship between social media and conventional media always a sort of moving, shifting ground, and perhaps something that will come up today. Um, but but primarily, I think that in higher education and research, we are shaped by what is happening in the mainstream media, and we're well served, in my opinion, in the UK by capable intelligent, specialized and general reporting of our sector. Uh, and compared to other countries, uh, it does stand out. And I think in many respects, uh, the quality media in the UK, the Economist, the, um, the Guardian, the, 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 the Financial Times, the major players really do set the, the, uh, um, a, high, a high bar in terms of the uh, discussion that occurs. And of course, at the other end, you've got an appalling media in the tabloids, which twists and and distorts and, and shapes politics in a, in a really retrograde way. So we've got this strange tension between the, the best and the worst of the media. But I think what we have with us today, and usually in relation to reporting of our sector, is the good part. Um, so a pleasure to welcome our great cast of journalists today. Um, we have with us The Guardian, Times Higher, uh, Wonky, Research Professional News, and we also have Happy, um, most valued um, colleague, Nick Hillman, um, and, uh, and the most important think tank in the sector. And, uh, and also Peter Scott, who's um, a former um, Times Hire editor and, uh, and someone who knows the media very well. 
but has subsequently done all the other things in the sector that make you somewhere between a, a poacher and a gamekeeper, I guess. Um, so let's start. And um, our first speaker is going to be Anna Fazakali from The Guardian. And many of us, I think, depend on the, the acumen, the sharpness of, of Anna's reporting of the sector. Um, she's been right, working on higher education throughout her career, she says. Um, she, like Nick Hellman, she worked with David Willits, uh, a most uh, important education minister in modern times. Um, and she also worked on the um, education desk at Policy Exchange. Now, each speaker has about eight to 10 minutes. And at this point, let me welcome, warmly welcome Anna. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, how I perceive things um, at the moment from um, the position of being somebody who writes just about universities for The Guardian. Um, I have um, written about universities for um, a very long time. So I have um, witnessed that universities come in and out of um, fashion. Um, in the media. Sometimes it's quite hard to get stories um, about universities into newspapers at all. And right now that absolutely is not the case. Universities are at the forefront of the news agenda because of the pandemic. Um, on one level, that's been a really good thing. Um, the pandemic has been the most astonishing PR campaign for universities. Um, the search for a um, vaccine and the fact that the um, government is, is seeing, um, the public, sorry, is seeing that we really rely on scientists and social scientists for advice has um, has, has just demonstrated how important universities are in, in the most brilliant way. Um, but most vice chancellors that I speak to are feeling incredibly bruised at the moment. They perceive the pandemic as um, one long round of negative stories um, about miserable students, who are sitting in the window of their hall bedroom with post-its on the window saying, give us our money back. Um, and to a large part, I think that this has been the government's fault. The government has failed to bail out universities. It's failed to give them any real reassurance. Um, as a result, students are in universities, a lot of them are feeling that they have been cheated. They are feeling that um, they have been brought back onto campus so that universities can continue to charge them rent. And um, they feel that universities haven't been honest about the diminished experience that they were going to have this year. Um, for my part, I, I am very sympathetic towards universities. I can see why all of this has happened. They're operating in a market. They need to get students in. They need to get bums on seats. And they were terrified that too much honesty would simply stop that from happening, that people wouldn't want to come to university. So I, I can see that. But I do actually think that vice chancellors um, have have um, been quite negligent. They have failed to engage properly in the discussion during the pandemic. Um, again, I can understand why. There have been um, many, um, many painful stories about the extent of their salaries. That's put a lot of vice chancellors off wanting to talk to journalists at all. And mostly I think that they're worried that they're going to be tried in some sort of kangaroo court of public opinion and they're not going to come off well. Um, but what I would say to them is that the few vice chancellors who have talked frankly to me on the record over this last year have been able to put across quite a nuanced argument. They've been able to talk about the difficulties of managing all of this uncertainty, of being the person who, you're, who people are coming to for answers, staff and students and parents, when actually you haven't really got the answers. They've been able to talk about the difficulty of persuading students not to party, um, while at the same time knowing that those students are adults and that not all of them will listen. Um, and
and uh, yeah so i think what i'm what i'm trying to say here is that it's it's not actually enough to just moan about the media and negative stories um, from the sidelines. You have to engage in the discussion. And if you do so, you can actually shape it. I think one thing that's also coming into play here is that quite often vice chancellors tell me privately that um, they don't want to be seen to complain um, in lots of ways um, compared to some sectors, they have it pretty good at the moment and they are aware that um, they're deeply unpopular with the treasury right now um, the student the accounting rules have changed and um, student loans um, now can't count as part of current expenditure which means that universities are suddenly seen as a really expensive pain in the ass by larger elements of the treasury and so there is a view in universities at management level that um, you mustn't be seen to criticize, that it's far better to just work the back channels. My um, observation as an outsider is that um, right now, um, the government is managing pretty effectively to shift the blame for everything that is happening during the pandemic onto universities. If students talk about rebates, they say, talk to your universities about it. If you're not happy, it's not really anything to do with us. Sorry about that. The government has um, dropped Erasmus. It's currently cutting 130 million quid of um, aid research that's already been granted. So my observation is that working the back channels and not complaining isn't actually working terribly well for universities and perhaps they ought to try a different tack. Um, I'll just finish by saying that as well as popularity of universities in papers going out of in and out of fashion, um, so the issues change over the years, what news desks actually want reporters to write about. And I just want to flag up one issue that I think is having a resurgence at the moment that I think is really deeply depressing and worrying. And that is this old, um, this old issue of do too many people go to university? Um, I thought this one had been put to bed many years ago and people had stopped um, making silly comments about Mickey Mouse degrees. They'd stopped saying that too many people had a higher education. And suddenly it feels very much to me as though we are back there. Um, and it, I find it really depressing that quite often when I read the comments at the bottom of my stories in The Guardian, which is supposed to be our, one of our most liberal newspapers, very often readers are busy saying exactly that. Too many people go to university. And I suspect quite often the people who are saying that have been to university themselves. They've profited from it. It's changed their lives, but they're perfectly happy to pull up the drawbridge now that they're sorted and happy in their career. Um, that maybe wouldn't matter, but it really matters now because I think that we have a government that feels exactly the same way. Gavin Williamson, the Ed Education Secretary, um, bizarrely wants to be the po poster boy for sort of smashing up the 50% target and making sure that fewer people go to university. Um, and I think that this is one issue that universities absolutely need to get behind. Um, you know, they can't sit back and not talk about this. They've got to get ahead of this issue because otherwise um, bad things are going to happen. This is a government that wants to talk about value and it perceives that value as far as I can see um, in terms of salary. And as a journalist who has always, um, a journalist and a woman, I should say, who has always been paid extremely badly, um, but has nonetheless felt extremely fulfilled in her career and wouldn't choose a different path, I find that notion of value um, both wrong and deeply insulting. Um, so I think the universities need to be sort of at the front of the campaign to, to sort of write that discussion. So I'll end there. I'll just stop by saying that I think that um, my job is to answer questions that parents and students might have about universities. My job is to hold the government to account 
um, in terms of what it's doing um, to universities. And my job is to hold universities to account too. Um, I don't see myself as being a threat to the sector, but sometimes I wish that the sector would help me out by engaging a little bit better in the discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Anna. Um, there's some challenges there, I think. Um, you have to engage in the discussion in, in order to, to shape it. Uh, being quiet, keeping out of trouble doesn't work when universities are left carrying the can for what are arguably policy responsibilities. Um, universities need to be more articulate in arguing the case for expansion of participation. Uh, economic value is not social value, but that's not sufficiently understood. Um, happy now at this point to hand over to Chris Havergal. Chris is the um, Times Higher Education's uh, news editor and has been since 2017. And many of us have worked with him in that capacity. And Times Higher, most important reporter on the sector, uh, carries a, a significant group of journalists who specialize in reporting higher education and research uh, and, uh, and does so on a worldwide basis, not just in the relation to the UK. Chris. Thanks, Simon, and uh, thanks also to Anna for that uh, introduction. I um, uh, agree with a, a great deal of what she said, and I'll, I'll try not to, to duplicate or repeat uh, too much of it. I just wanted to start, I suppose, with my own uh, personal perspective. Um, I love being a journalist, uh, writing about higher education. I think it's a great sector to cover. There are a few sectors globally that make the headlines and indeed make the front pages on such a frequent basis. And in particular, I love working with academics uh, they've got strongly held views on really interesting topics and they're able to they're able and willing to articulate them very clearly so that's a that's a journalist's dream but i appreciate that these headlines don't always make comfortable reading for those in universities uh, and in recent years i think they've felt under attack and uh, you know really under siege on everything from from free, free speech to graduate employment like anna says uh, their relations with China, Vice Chancellor Pei, you know, I, I could go on, it's a, it's a long list. Um, my view on this is that a lot of this scrutiny and indeed a fair amount of the uh, criticism um, isn't surprising. Uh, much of it indeed is, is legitimate. Universities these days are organisations that have absolutely huge budgets. They receive significant public funding and they're central to um, the sort of goals of our governments and of our countries and also our sort of progress um, globally, you know, just as we look at the pandemic in, in recent months. There are many other sectors in the UK which and globally that have uh, faced similar levels of scrutiny. But I do think there have been um, significant shifts in the last decade or so. Um, I guess the most, in some ways, the most significant of those has been the growing costs of higher education to the public purse, but also I think probably most significantly to the to the private purse. And um, Rosemary Bennett sets out very well in the, her happy paper, uh, which was published recently, how that has made higher education the, you know, the ultimate consumer story, which for a starter uh, elevates it up the news agenda, but also often puts um, the, the newspapers on, on the side of the students as opposed to um, the universities. As I say, I think there are legitimate questions and you know difficult things that universities have had to deal with on issues like Vice Chancellor pay, uh, grade inflation, um, unconditional offers, uh, you know many other topics. Just looking at my personal experience, you know I was a student at the sort of start of this millennium, had sort of two hours contact time for the majority of my time as a student. And, um, you know, I thought that was, I thought that was fine. What were the lecturers meant to do sort of uh, stand in front of us while we read in the library? You know, it wasn't going to happen. That said, I was paying, you know, a thousand pounds a year uh, tuition fees. In fact, I was probably lucky enough that my parents were paying. Um, if you are a family paying nine thousand pounds a year, if you're doing that for several children, uh, you know, if it's a, a student trying to pay their own way, it's a significantly uh, different situation. Um, so uh, alongside the sort of the, the, the emergence of higher education as a consumer story, I think the other big shift has been the sort of broader politicisation of public debate and in particular sort of scepticism about the role of public institutions. And I think universities have been sector, singled out probably more than any other sector, probably, you know, more so than, well, alongside sort of politicians in the judiciary, perhaps. But I think they've been particularly singled out because they have been 
perceived uh, to be what some people would describe sort of, I guess, bastions of left-wing bias is the term that's used. And because they've also found themselves on the on the losing side of the political debate at times, if you consider the four years of the, the Trump presidency and indeed the Brexit vote in the UK. This has sort of particularly sort of manifested itself in terms of headlines and policies in terms of the debate about uh, free speech, no platforming and, and safe spaces. This is a sort of the side of the debate where actually I think a lot of the criticism isn't legitimate. I think um, there are very few examples where people have actually been no platformed by a university or by a student's union. Much of this is uh, sort of hyped up in the media or indeed by politicians and a certain element of it is sort of stage managed by people on the right who want to give universities a beating. Um, I think there is a broader issue in the academy about the willingness of uh, students and uh, people who work in universities to engage with alternative viewpoints and uh, people who espouse those viewpoints. You only have to look at if we um, on Times Higher publish a opinion piece which doesn't fall into line with that orthodoxy, you know, the accusations that we're sort of Hawking clickbait, or you know, why you know why are we giving a view to you know a, a, a space to these people? You know, we we do want to have a true sort of diversity of of opinion. I think there is an issue with people being unwilling to engage with that. But I do think a lot of the debate around um, free speech and some of the policy proposals that have flowed from that um, have not been based on good evidence. Um, nevertheless, putting those two things together, um, the sort of consumer shift and the political shift means universities are feeling under attack from above uh, and, and from below. And the other key trend that sort of goes hand in hand with both of these is the emergence of social media. For a starter, it brings a lot of incidents and issues in universities to journalists' attention that in the past, journalists just simply wouldn't heard, have heard about them. They might have eventually found out about them for reading a student newspaper. But these days, if, if someone gets shouted down in a talk at Oxford or Durham or wherever, um, you know, that'll be in the Daily Telegraph within 36 hours, you'd expect, if not if not 12 hours. Um, social media also allows these stories to be shared much more widely. It allows, um, it means that people in universities read stories about universities in newspapers like the Daily Mail and things like that, places where that they probably wouldn't have even been aware of those stories had it been 20, 30 years ago. And then in terms of the sort of ensuing debate about that coverage um, of universities, I think it makes it a much more toxic debate if we look at the uh, general sort of tone of commentary on social media. Um, the, the flip side of this is that universities continue to receive really positive coverage and extensive coverage of their contributions in terms of research. Again, we talk about the vaccine, we talk about every other scientific discovery. Um, you know, they're never um, far from the front pages, but this, isn't, this doesn't seem to be a set of scales where positive coverage of research can somehow outweigh um, that sort of more negative debate about the role of universities. Um, they appear to be completely separate um, equations. So, I mean, just to sort of wrap up then by looking at what the role of universities is in this debate, but also what the role of journalists is. Um, I think journalists, as Simon says, in the UK generally do a very good job of covering higher education. I think if you look in the US with publications like the Chronicle and Inside Higher Ed, again, there's extremely strong coverage. Likewise, if you're in somewhere like uh, Australia um, with you know significant coverage that we provide, uh, the Australian provides, uh, the Australian Financial Review and specialist publications as well, I think the sector is well served with specialist journalism. That said, journalists, be they specialist titles or in the mainstream media, um, they're always under significant pressure to uh, to sort of follow the, what the trend or what's hot or sort of jump on the bandwagon of whatever sort of attack story there is of the day. Um, the scrutiny of universities isn't always even. You only have to look at the obsession with Oxbridge uh, in the national press. And you know, journalists are also to an extent um, guilty of sometimes being swept along with ministerial agendas. Again, if you look at this debate about, about free speech. But I agree with Anna that uh, universities also have a lot of work to do. Uh, they're far too often too obsessed with their reputation. Uh, too often their, their attitude when faced with criticism or hostile stories is to, is to shut down rather than to sort of be open and, and, and fess up and try to learn from that experience. Um, and I think sometimes they sort of wrongly dismiss issues of not being sort of 
legitimate or not being fair, you know, when again, they'd be much better engaging. Again, the example of Vice Chancellor Pay is key there. I agree absolutely that uh, Vice Chancellors um, and senior academics need to engage with the debate more openly, uh, to speak up for the benefits of autonomy, um, of academic freedom, and of you know, supporting universities. Again, you know, the research funding cuts, which are potentially in the pipeline for UK universities are just sort of one of the most sort of you know, tragic examples of, of how this can happen. Um, and I think by speaking out uh, more openly, they're in a better position to highlight where, um, as we've said, is very often the case that the failings are on the part of the government rather than on the part of the universities. But when those vice chancellors speak out and senior academics speak out, they do have to be much more willing to engage with and combat opposing views far too often during the Brexit, run up to the Brexit referendum. We saw, um, you know, Universities UK or whichever group put on a panel on Brexit saying it's a panel discussion about Brexit and it would be sort of, you know, four vice chancellors or university leaders who all thought Brexit was a terrible thing. There needs to be a much, much, much more sort of um, willingness to take to engage with those difficult viewpoints. Um, but perhaps what I'd also finally say, is there is a limit to what um, universities can do here because it's very easy to say, oh, well, universities need to, to speak up more and that will solve things. I'm not convinced it will. I think we've seen um, you know, big societal shifts, as I say, particularly this general sort of more toxic public debate that we see on social media and the sort of you know, intense scrutiny and scepticism, um, you know, more scepticism of major public institutions we see as a much more sort of politicised public debate. So I don't think universities um, speaking up more and being open is going to solve all of these issues, but I think it will solve some of them. It will show where governments have a role to play and um, it's certainly worth a try. Thanks. Well, thanks, Chris. And there's food for thought there again, isn't there? I mean, um, the um, scrutiny and the criticism um, often justified, mostly justified uh, in the case of the scrutiny. Uh, the value for money issue will not go away. Uh, and there's a public and a private dimension to that, as Anna also mentioned. Um, no platform uh, hyped up, manufactured issue, but there's something there to, to deal with. And social media will keep those issues bubbling along. Uh, inevitably, a more toxic climate with social media lurking and, uh, at the edges. Um, and uh, the, the message about engagement, um, you know, the, if you don't engage, it all gets a bit worse for universities. Well, Nick, um, you do engage uh, and uh, we look forward to your contribution. Nick Hillman is uh, Director of, of the Higher Education Policy Institute and has been since 2014. He previously worked with um, David Willits when he was the Minister for Universities and Science. And um, I also had a stint, I think, as a special advisor in the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. Nick. Uh, thanks so much, Simon. And uh, thanks for inviting me to be here. It's fantastic to be able to speak to your 200th uh, one of these events. I mean, I listened into quite a few of them, including the one uh, excellent one on China the other day, but I hadn't realised you got to 200. And I, it's fantastic to see the centre going on from uh, strength to strength under your leadership and Claire, uh, uh, leadership of Claire and, uh, uh, and you and others. Um, so uh, I, I'm actually not a journalist and I've never been a journalist. So I guess I'm the uh, least uh, experienced person uh, to speak on this topic. But I work with the media every day and have done for uh, much more than a decade, both in my previous roles and my, and my current role. Um, and I just want to make, I've got eight minutes, so I want to make eight brief points, four of which are quite positive about the media and four of which are more questioning, I guess. Um, and the first, really, I'll be very brief because it's really repeating a point, Simon, that you made in your introduction, which is I actually think we're pretty well served uh, in the UK higher education sector by uh, the outlets that we have. We've got really good specialist outlets like some of those represented here today, like the Times Higher and Research Fortnight, uh, Wonky. Uh, 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 and we've got, of course, national newspapers and national broadcasters that continue to have full-time employed education specialists and that's uh, you know that's fantastic that's not 
true of uh, every sector. And in fact, before I worked in higher education, I worked in pensions and benefits. Uh, and I've got to say, our sector is much better served than uh, the pensions industry uh, was when I worked, certainly when I worked in it, I'm not sure about today. Um, my, my second point is that um, some of the specialist journalists we've got have been working uh, on the beat uh, for a really long time and really do know the issue very well. You can't pull the wool over their eyes uh, and, and get them to write what you want them to write. So you think, you know, I, it's a bit invidious to pick individuals, but, you know, some like Bramwyn Jeffries or Sean Coughlin at the BBC would be good examples uh, of this. Some of the panel are a good example of this. Anna's, uh, Anna years ago was, a, you know, sometimes the same journalists appear at different outlets, but still writing about education. And Anna's an example of this. Um, and the Times higher, I think, I think I'm right in saying, Chris will correct me, has had a very stable team for many years and it's actually survived two different changes of ownership at the Times High, but the team is still there writing in detail about our, our sector. So I, so I think we're lucky for that reason too. Um, a third reason why I'm feeling quite positive is um, that it seems to me uh, that in recent years, higher education has won a bigger share of the total education coverage uh, than it used to have. Uh, it's certainly, Peter, I, I think might have a slightly different view on this to me, but it seems to me that schools used to have a bigger share of the proportion uh, of coverage than they do today, and universities used to have a smaller share. Um, and I know some people think higher education still plays second fiddle to schools, but there were times in the past where I, I think it was barely in the orchestra at all. Um, and I, I appreciate that if I worked in further education, if I ran the further education policy in Institute, if, if such a body existed, and sadly it doesn't, uh, then I probably would be less positive. But nonetheless, I think higher education and universities uh, get a decent slug uh, of the coverage. So I've no complaint about the overall volume of higher education stories. Uh, fourthly, the sort of uh, last of my more positive points, I guess, uh, as uh, the former education editor of The Times, Rosie Bennett, uh, put it in her recent paper for Happy that Chris has just mentioned. Uh, there seems to be a better understanding, not perfect, but better understanding of the breadth of the higher education sector than there was uh, uh, some years ago. I mean, it's only about five years ago that the education editor of a leading national newspaper said to me, only ring me up if you've got a story about Oxbridge. I'm not interested unless your story is about Oxbridge. Um, and uh, I, if I, I don't really like pinpointing gradual changes to individual events, but I think if I was to do that, I think I would pinpoint it to the open universities problems, financial problems, appearing on the front page of the Daily Mail three years ago. I think that really shook people up because suddenly the Daily Mail was writing about our biggest, most diverse university and why it needed to survive. Um, so my second four points, which are a little bit, a little bit less positive, um, uh, is I would like the media to be more open-minded on league tables. So I'm not opposed to league tables. I know a lot of people in our sector are, but I'm not, I'm not opposed to them. They serve a purpose. They're not going to go away whether we want them to or not. As um, Richard Garner, who was a, a, a brilliant education journalist, who's now sadly uh, deceased, but as he wrote in a paper for us back in 2017, the appetite to read about league tables is, is too too strong for media outlets to ignore. Um, but because league tables are generally produced by media outlets, I don't think they always get the critical oversight they deserve. And in fact, the only happy publication of all the happy publications I can ever remember uh, uh, pushing uh, with the media in my seven and a bit years of happy that has had no coverage at all in the UK media was one that was critical of league tables. Um, it did get quite a lot of coverage in Ireland and in Australia and in other countries where their own newspapers are less well associated with individual league tables, but it got no coverage at all in the UK. And I thought it was a shame that our newspapers couldn't put their editorial function of reporting that paper aside from their sort of business function of producing the league tables and, and, and getting business on the back of it. Um, my sixth point, my second of my more negative points is I, I would I would prefer, I think there's been a hint of this in some of the uh, comments already, I would prefer that, if be honest, if there was a bit more focus on what I regard, uh, and I think other people regard, as the primary uh, order uh, of stories. So things like consumer demand uh, for higher education because of changing demographics, things like uh, financial sustainability of universities. Yes, these things get coverage 
but they don't get as much coverage as grade inflation, vice chancellors pay, free speech violations. Uh, and by the way, the point I'm making here is not actually having a digger meet the media. I think sometimes as a sector, we gift the sector silly stories, silly culture war stories. They're banning Christian groups from freshers fairs and things like that, which of course the media are going to write up. Of course they're going to write up. I'd write them up if I was a journalist. Uh, but we shouldn't gift them those stories in the first place. And we should make sure the stories that we think are more important are as interesting as those stories uh, clearly are. My penultimate point, uh, which uh, comes from Rosie Bennett's paper as well, uh, uh, and is really a point that Chris has already mentioned, which is that higher education has clearly become a consumer story. Um, and it's why, as Rosie talks about in her recent happy paper, uh, the pre-COVID strikes in UK universities that were largely but not solely about the USS pension scheme were reported much more about lectures missed and teaching time uh, that didn't happen than uh, they were reported about the financial pressures of a pension scheme with arguably the biggest deficit of any private sector pension scheme in the UK. Uh, I would argue that both those things were important in that strike, the, the lost teaching time and the size of the deficit in the pension scheme and why the scheme needs to be uh, reformed. And I would argue that that is an instance where perhaps the pendulum swung a little bit too far uh, in one direction and not the other. I would have liked to see an equal weight on the lost teaching time and the financial challenges of the pension scheme. Uh, finally, uh, I'd, I, I, I want to say a word about social media because the headline today is about media in general. And I think our sectors, when it, at its best, when it's civil, when it's evidence-based, when it's well-informed, when serious, grown-up, mature conversations are happening. Uh, and as night follows day, therefore, it's at its worst very often on social media. I mean, Simon referred to tablet but the social media's uh, problem uh, problem is much worse. Um, I recently wrote a series of three blogs about the, United, uh, the university superannuation scheme and the deficit that it faces that I've already mentioned. Uh, there were no personal slights in what I wrote. Uh, it was well in line with our charitable objectives as a, as a charity and a think tank. The piece is focused, I think, on an important policy issue. Um, and I certainly wasn't expecting everybody to agree with them. But I also wasn't expecting to be compared on social media to QAnon. Uh, and I don't know if all your listeners know what QAnon is, but it's a conspiracy theory that that claims, I don't know, the world's being ruled by Satan worshipping paedophiles, I think, that apparently only Donald Trump can save us from. You know, that is just... Uh, utterly absurd if we want serious debates. And so I think if we think about the media in the broadest debate, and we want the media to report fairly what we do, we can and must do better when we engage with ourselves uh, between each other uh, within the sector as well. Thanks, Simon. And thanks, Nick. Um, food for thought there, isn't there? And, and this issue about the social media and handling of HE isn't going to go away, obviously. And um, you know, I, I mean, I very much um, sympathise with what Nick has said uh, in relation to how we're at our best when the discussion is civil and intelligent, um, reasoned and inclusive, and at our worst when it boils down to a few characters with uh, red raw emotional buttons attached to them. Um, but we need to find a way through that problem, don't we? Because it's not just about higher education and science and research, it's about the nature of public life and um, democratic politics. Um, and those things, I think, are in the balance um, at present. So let me turn now to Debbie McVitie. Um, Debbie is the editor of Wonky, and Wonky has, I think, carved out a role for itself as the, the daily um, explainer of the sector and, you know, the magnificent quality of the reportage and the data analysis the, and the information itself. I think the power of information um, is shown not only by conventional media, but it's shown by the way Wonky is built a, a whole role for itself around the importance of clear, clearly articulated, uh, objective, solid um, inf information about the sector. And it's the place that many of us go to first, just to see what's happening on a daily basis, which is tremendous, really. It's a tremendous achievement in a short time to have built that kind of unique operation. Um, Debbie's um, had a stint, I think, with um, Universities UK. Uh, and before that, a history in student politics and, a, you know, what you might say, a good history in student politics in terms of constructive contribution to um, to issues, to understanding not only the student estate, but policy more generally. Debbie. 
Thanks very much, Simon. It's a real pleasure to be here. Can I just check that you can hear me okay? So, yes, you can. Okay. wonderful. Um, so thank you so much to my colleague. It's, it's actually, it's real, um, it's quite an exciting moment for me actually to be kind of, you know, among the, the echelons of higher education journalists, because it's certainly not something that um, I ever really thought of myself as being. And, um, and I think that sort of speaks to the sort of slightly old position uh, that, that Wonky holds in the sector. I, Wonky came about because, um, well, I mean, I, I, su I suppose there's an implied critique of, of media in, in, in the existence of Wonky and, and, that, and that's not, it's not really intended that way actually. It came about because, um, one of the things that we've found in the last decade, I think, is, is that, you know, higher education policy, particularly, you know, what, what government is saying and doing uh, has, has moved so very rapidly over the last decade, you know, thanks in part to people like Nick, um, that uh, if you're just a person who's working in higher education, trying to make sense of it all, trying to think about what you should do in, in response to that, uh, you know, that was getting increasingly complicated, you know, not, notwithstanding, you know, the, the quality of the reporting uh, that was going on. And so we thought, well, let's create a space for uh, not only people who work in policy and who kind of know, you know, know the ropes a bit and who kind of know who the players are and where the bodies are buried to, to try and explain that, but also to create a space for the people who are affected by it to speak um, you know, ab about the, that experience and, and bring their own analysis to bear. And that's kind of what Wonky is for is, you know, a lot of our content is community generated and, and a lot of it comes from, I suppose, what you would call experts in that, you know, we've all, none of us actually come from a journalistic background, we all come from a policy analysis background. And um, if you're being uncharitable, you might say you could probably see that in the writing. But uh, so, so kind of with that in mind, really, I quite like to chat. I think, you know, there's lots to agree with and lots to disagree with with what, with what my colleagues have said. And, you know, I think we can probably get into that in the Q&A. Um, just talk a little bit about how, um, how I see media changing. Um, and, I, you know, I won't, I won't take the credit for any of these ideas, of course, if you've read uh, New Power uh, by uh, Henry Timms and, and Jeremy, Jeremy Hymans, you will be aware of sort of some of the sorts of analysis that, that are brought to bear on, on this landscape. So, uh, you know, in a world, lots of my colleagues talked about social media, and um, and I think it, 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 social media, kind of a decade ago, started as this wonderful space that was, with this really sort of strongly democratizing instinct. You know, anybody could, uh, you know, bring an opinion into a space and and and, and debate it and, and hear from other people. And it was actually this really kind of friendly environment. And of course, it's it's become this kind of you know sort of hellscape where we can only hear people who agree with us and or with whom we kind of profoundly disagree. Um, where uh, Wonky is actually in the middle of a bit of a kind of Twitter storm of our own at the minute. And I have every sympathy with Nick's experience when when he wrote about USS. I mean, that's something that every, and I think and, and I think it genuinely does actually there is a there, there is genuinely a bit of a chilling effect you know organizations like ours that are not uh, you know we are we are we are small and, and, and we're we're not kind of I guess uh, mainstream media is not a really weighted term isn't it but we're you know we, 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 we you know we don't have a big legal fund to defend us from, from from people who might who might kind of wish us ill so you genuinely do think I think quite carefully before you you, you say things um and that does mean that the quality of debate is uh, can be compromised. Um, it also, I think, keeps us honest in that we make, you know, we make jolly sure we've dotted our eyes and crossed our t's before we say anything that might get us into hot water. So there, you know, I think these things, um, you know, they are, they, you know, there's swings and roundabouts to some extent, but. I think fundamentally, you know, we can all agree that there's there's a, a level of toxicity there, but it's not going anywhere. Um, and so what do you do about it? If you've got, you know, for, from a university perspective, you know, you've got academics organizing um, and discussing uh, pensions valuation and bringing all this different expertise to bear in a way that is enormously disruptive. It's, it's you know, it is, uh, it, it, you know, it, it creates the kind of context for some seriously unpleasant stuff to be talked about, but it also creates the context to fundamentally challenge some extremely, vest, you know, big, big vested interests um, and, and for, you know, the entire pension scheme to look again at how it conducts its valuations. Um, you think about students organizing um, to, to, you know, to call for fee refunds as a result of COVID. Okay, yeah, so what that does is completely kind of eliminates any kind of acknowledgement in the narrative about how hard universities have worked, how well they have done against some really kind of challenging odds during COVID, but it, it creates this kind of space for, for these voices to come through that would otherwise have been kind of carefully glossed over and kind of put away by, by you know, you know, university comms teams. So what is, you know, the, the challenge for universities, I think, is what, you know, what, what do you do? What, what do you do with that? How do you, you know, you can't just keep batting it off, keeping it at arm's length. You've got to respond. You've got to, you've got to think differently about how you engage with the public. And one of the questions for this webinar was, you know, to whom are universities accountable? Um, and I think, you know, the kind of associated question is who, who are universities speaking to? Um, I thought it was interesting that Anna said uh, the 
uh, universities don't want to be seen to be complaining because they're not very popular in the treasury. And, sort of, you know, and, and of course, that's exactly how, how universities often think, is if, if I say this in the pages of, of the media or some kind of media outlet, somebody in the treasury will read it and think badly of me. But of course, that's the, the, the idea that universities are primarily speaking to policymakers is, is kind of odd, really, isn't it? Because really, the, the, the compact that universities should have is with the public, with policymakers as, as the representatives of the public, rather than, uh, the, you know, the, the sort of the people who are kind of holding the purse strings and who can kind of uh, open them or close them at will. Um, and I think that sort of changes how, how you might think about, about engagement with the media. So rather than thinking about media as this entity that's got to be kept at arm's length, that's got to be managed um, and, you know, sort of, these sort of very kind of guarded conversations with, with press officers, which is entirely understandable, I think universities ought to do more to kind of essentially seize, seize a bit more control of the narrative, um, you know, set their own agendas and bring their own analysis to bear. And I think where I disagree perhaps with my colleagues is that I, I do not think that that should be primarily on matters that are affect universities. I think, you know, universities have lots to say about whether people should go to university and what the funding should be and um, how to widen access and um, you know, the, the value of a university education. But so much of that is what, what they are able to say in that space is essentially self-interested and it comes across that way. They do not, I don't think they've got the, you know, they don't really have the legitimacy to talk about those things until they're also talking about uh, the issues that they're seeing in their local communities, uh, talking about the global impact of um, uh, in, you know, in, international travel on, uh, on, on, you know, on global sustainability and the climate. And I think you know, universities not need to uh, use the kind of powers that they have to bring, in, bring an analysis to bear on social problems. Um, rather than what, what I think they do at the minute too much is, is essentially kind of peddling good news studies and, and, and trying to kind of create that sort of sense of, you know, the university is, um, you know, our university is doing very well and that's the story. I don't, I don't think that is the story. I think you need to be a bit more kind of mindful about it, saying, well, we have to have an analysis here. We have to have an angle and we have to understand that. We have to be our own kind of journalists in that regard. Um, but I suppose the other kind of closing thought I would bring is, is that, that, that one of the reasons that is challenging is because just as it's not entirely clear who universities are trying to speak to, it's really not clear who speaks for the university. Um, and we talk an awful lot about vice chancellors and how vice chancellors should speak up more and how vice chancellors should, uh, you know, play more of a role in, in public public discourse. And I absolutely can't disagree with that. I, you know, I, I think I think they should, of course they do, because that's the sort of thing that kind of keeps keep, uh, keeps people coming to our site. And especially when vice chancellors say something that you don't expect them to say, which happens, you know, more and more rarely. Um, but it is, I think, genuinely challenging for vice chancellors to speak for the university um, because of the way the university is structured. Um, individual academics can't possibly speak for the, for the university, but, you know, the academy as a whole, I think, is a sort of entity that is distinct from, you know, perceived as distinct from the vice chancellor. Um, and the poor old comms teams are, in, in a lot of cases, highly, highly under-resourced um, and not really senior enough to have the credibility to say anything other than, you know, oh, have you seen this researcher? They're doing some marvellous work, um, in which we write back and say, I'm terribly sorry, that's not interesting enough. Can you come back with something a bit more interesting? Um, and, and, so, and so it goes on. So honestly, I think universities need to beef up their uh, investment in comms. I think that would then mean that they uh, had the credibility to speak on more things. And uh, it would mean also that the vice chancellor didn't sort of feel like they were the only person who could speak um, in a meaningful way about, about what the university does. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily solve all the problems, but I think it would might get us, get us a bit further down the line. Well, thank you, Debbie. That was really helpful, wasn't it? I mean, the engagement point means social media. It means we have to be positive and proactive and very good at social media. And I think the, um, so those of us who just talked about toxic social media have rightly put back in our box, I think. But, uh, and you're right also about the beefing up comms. I think that's really important. And um, that's where the capacity to intervene in those debates is going to come. But what I really liked also was your point about, you know, taking up issues beyond self-interest and beyond the sector itself. I think that's really, um, you know, who, who else is going to do this well uh, if we don't do it? We have the expertise. We have the knowledge. We have tr tremendous worldwide networks. We have deep um, understandings of many issues. We should be much more contributing much more to the public than we do. Um, and in that context, let me bring in someone who contributes to the public all the time. It's Peter Scott. Um, Peter uh, is a Professor of Higher Education Studies at UCL Institute of Education. He's also the Commissioner for Fair Access in Scotland. And it's in that capacity, he recently gave a webinar in our series. Um, Peter's had many roles in relation to the sector, um, not only as former Vice-Chancellor of Kingston University and a, a previous stint as Pro Vice-Chancellor at Leeds, but also through his role in policy making um, at, at uh, Hefke, where he chaired 
two strategic committees. So very uh, grateful that you could take part, Peter, and we look forward to what you've got to say. Uh, thank you, Simon. Can you hear me okay? We can. Good, good, okay. Um, well, I feel slightly on the defensive because apart from Nick, uh, everyone else is a working journalist speaking today. Um, and although I did spend half my career as a journalist, it was quite some time ago, I have to say. I'm, so I'm very much a kind of a 20th century journalist. I'm very much a print journalist, I was. Uh, and in what used to be called then the quality uh, papers. Um, um, uh, just to give you, just to allow you to date yourself, uh, the, the Reese Mogg I knew was not Jacob, but his dad, William, who was my boss. At the time. <laughs> um, but I suppose uh, on, on, on the more positive side, I do have multiple perspectives. I mean, uh, within the media, I've been most things, a reporter, a general reporter, a specialist reporter, I've been a leader writer, I've been an editor of a specialist weekly, of course. Uh, and I've been a columnist more recently, having two stints on The Guardian until I got to uh, too boring and, and was replaced by more exciting people like uh, Anna. Um, uh, and in higher education, as you say, uh, Simon, uh, I've worked as a professor, I've been a vice chancellor, so I've dealt with some of the kind of uh, issues there, particularly one very nasty case in relation to social media. Um, uh, and I'm now sort of working, I suppose you could say, for Nicholas Sturgeon. Anyway, um, with that sort of um, qualification defense in mind, um, my comments, I think, are going to be rather different from some of the other ones that have been made, because mine's very much a kind of helicopter view, I think, of uh, the relationship between the media uh, and, and, uh, and higher education. Um, and of course, it's immensely difficult to, to generalize about this. Um, I mean, there are so many different outlets, um, all with different agendas, TV and radio, then local and national, there's a difference there the tabloids, the more serious, the old quality press and so on, magazines, general magazines, especially like The Economist and The New Statesman and The Spectator, and then obviously a specialist weekly is like The Times Higher, and then the websites like Conversation, One KG, and then of course there were the social media, um, which we all are, 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 are hating during this webinar. Um, the problem with the social media, they're a bit like new tables, I mean they're not going to go away, um, uh, and of course, um, I don't think they're really going to get censored that much, except at the ultimate extreme. So this is something we're going to have to live with, I think. And then, of course, another factor I think you need to bear in mind is that all these different kind of formats. I mean, there's the kind of reporter. Um, I'm not sure we have too many kind of New York style type reporting now, because I think on the whole, it's a bit more um, um, opinionate often. Uh, and I'll say something about how papers have become tr quite tribal. Um, then there's um, you know, editorials, columns, um, and ultimately there are blogs and blogs are becoming more and more important. And blogs are a very kind of hybrid form because if you write a blog, you can combine being a reporter, writing an editorial and writing a column all in one in a kind of rather kind of sort of unstable mix. Um, yet blogs I suspect are gonna be very important in the future. Um, uh, so inevitably it's pretty risky, I think, to make any general statements. Um, but I guess I'm here to make some general statements, so I'll have a go and I'll be prepared to shot down, be shot down. Um, well, I start by saying I probably don't have such a positive view of, of, of media coverage of, of, of universities as some of the kind of working journalists have had, and maybe that's because I'm showing my age. Um, but um, I think on the whole, higher education, as schools do, suffer from a kind of a relatively negative image. I mean, after all, we last year we got out and we clapped for doctors and nurses. We don't clap for teachers, um, certainly not university teachers, um, and teachers very quickly in the media almost certainly bracketed with unions, which are a bad thing. So there's that kind of general problem. Now, I agree with Anna, during the COVID pandemic, um, universities have received a lot more coverage. Um, but my guess would be, if you talk to people, you would find the things that stuck in their mind were students being ripped off, students being locked up in their halls, security fences around their halls, et cetera, et cetera. They're not actually about AstraZeneca. I mean, okay, that's linked to the University of Oxford and Oxford's always mentioned, but somehow there's a disconnect there. Universities don't kind of benefit, it seems to me, from that. So I think the, if you stripped out the, the obvious stories, vice chancellors pay, students locked up, um, grade inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, cancel culture, knocking down statues, you would find actually the amount of coverage on higher education was relatively limited. Um, 
Now, what kind of coverage have we got? Inevitably, I think everything's human interest now. You watch the BBC News now, uh, and uh, they don't give you stats. They give you one person saying one thing and one person saying another, and it's always on the streets and it's visual and so on. Um, uh, so the things we're interested in tend to be things like, and then people are important. So uh, the recent case in Loughborough, where someone was apparently, well, as it was reported, was sacked for using capital letters in his emails. When you dug into the uh, actual tribunal case, it was much more complicated than that. Um, or the recent case of, of the professor, I'm not sure if he's a professor or lecturer at Bristol, there's been all the row about. Um, then, of course, uh, the focus on students as consumers, um, and that's inevitable because of the kind of higher education system we've created, certainly here in England, which is highly um, uh, marketized, you could say. Um, interesting, again, what gets covered, I think, you know, um, it's an interesting story today that uh, the Office for Students has produced their report on the National Student Survey at the request of the government would come up with the wrong answer. It'd be interesting to see what happens there, actually. Um, I think it's going to be pretty difficult for politicians to be deflected from their preconceived view that the National Student Survey has led to great, great inflation. Then the third category is, I mean, big bad institutions. Well, I, I mean, all big organizations to some degree are um, unpopular, I think. It's a kind of, we live in a more populist kind of age. Um, but it seems to me universities don't get quite such a fair break as NHS trusts do, um, unless, of course, there have been some scandal about uh, deaths in maternity departments and so on. Um, on the whole, there's an assumption that universities uh, are kind of guilty until proved innocent, it often seems to me. And of course, there's, there's ammunition there, overpaid vice chancellors. I assure you I wasn't one of them. Um, uh, issues about redundancies, tribunal cases, covers up. And, and I agree, the natural instinct of universities, like of hospitals and many other large organizations, if they're faced and challenged with a kind of bad news, their instinct is to kind of cover up. Um, uh, uh, so, and then there are other agendas which come in, which are sort of brought in from outside. I mean, Black, Black Lives Matter, statues, trans rights, you know, um, woke culture, cancel culture, and so on. And again, that's inevitable because the journalists have to sell their story to the news desk and news desk these are the kind of things issues that are being talked about so if you can find a higher education or university angle on that that works well in your your paper then your story gets covered <clears throat> um on the whole i don't think uh, the media have quite the same appetite for difficult issues like complex policies um uh, difficult data to interpret, although I have to say Wonky is a complete exception of this. I mean, I don't think I would understand most higher education data if I wasn't able to read David two or three times a week. Um, um, and there are some issues that come up. So policy, what comes up in terms of policy? Well, I think I can't exactly remember who's mentioned it, but the idea that sort of, I think it was Anna actually initially, that, that the idea of more means worse, which everyone thought was dead and buried back in the 1960s in Kingsley Amos, that that's come back and that too many people going to university. Um, uh, now, of course, it's true, um, as Chris said, that there's on the other side of the balance, there's research and research is very important. And there are also, there's lots of coverage about research, but I sometimes wonder how much connection in the public mind there is between this research is being done and how wonderful it is and how important it is. And actually, giving the credit to the universities that on the whole provide the infrastructure, the resources, pay the salaries, et cetera, et cetera, that have allowed that research to take place. And the same happens. I mean, there are some immensely po popular kind of public intellectuals you could call. I mean, you know, Mary Beard, David Orisago at, at Manchester, but do Cambridge and Manchester, have they benefited from that? You know, or do people make that kind of association? We don't actually on the whole, and it's a point Debbie made. I mean, I would love universities in a sense to, play the public intellectual role much more strongly, but I'm not sure that's always to British taste. I mean, it's okay in France, they expect that's what's gonna happen. Now, why is this, such, not everyone will agree with what I've just said, but uh, that's my kind of rough over, overview of what's happening. So why is this? Um, well, I think first of all, as I hinted, I think the media's become more tribal. I mean, I'm a law guardian reader, but I'm never surprised by what I read in the Guardian, frankly. Um, and I'm sure people read the Daily Mail, it's the same thing. You're not surprised. Now, why is that? Um, well, there has been a kind of polarization of opinions, I think. Um, so people become less tolerant of alternative views. So they don't want to see alternative views, even in their newspaper. Um, some of the intolerance that's on display in social media, I think is also in, on, on display in, in, in how newspapers see the world as well. 
Um, and I guess there's always a commercial imperative as well. You don't want to annoy potential readers and so on. Um, uh, so we get this extraordinary idea that the BBC is somehow being put into a kind of tribal box, leftist, metropolitan, elite, and so on, however uncomfortable it feels. And so we've got to have, uh, you know, uh, GB News or UK News instead to balance that. Then the second issue about the media is I think on the whole, um, there's probably a lack of resource. We talked a bit, uh, I think it was Debbie mentioned that we need to beef up comms teams in, in universities, but I sometimes the same applies to universe, to, to, to the media itself. Um, there've been quite substantial cuts in the number of journalists and what journalists are able to do, how much they can get out of the office and report in a kind of old fashioned way is probably even more restricted as well. So there's a, a, a kind of screen dependence. And so now inevitably we live in an electronic age, you'd like to do that, but, um, but that's a problem, I think. Um, I think there's a premium on what I call re resource light reporting, which is of course why the social media can sometimes kind of come back into it and become a, a sort of story in its own right. And then finally, and the media can't really escape from this, there has been a bias against kind of experts and professionals. They've been associated with the elites. Remember the blob? I mean, that was Michael Gove when he was education secretary. That was his view of uh, educational uh, journal and not educational um, researchers because they came up with the wrong answer. Then Brexit, of course, has intensified all that. And I think during the kind of COVID pandemic, there's been a very interesting kind of balance between, it's a very uneasy balance, you know, on the one hand, we trust these people, they're obviously very important scientists, on the other hand, you know, th there's an awful swirling around of alternative views and the same, there's a very odd kind of uneasy relationship there, I think, um, and it's very obvious in politics itself, where on the whole, people don't want complicated stories, politicians don't want complicated stories, um, and many university and higher education stories are quite complicated. But then let me switch over to the other side, universities, um, because quite a lot's changed there as well. First of all, universities have become operating in a much more competitive environment. We put a lot of resource into branding, if not always comms teams, we put a lot of resource into branding, marketing. And of course we have to compete for students in a much more kind of overt kind of way. Um, so that's a very different world for the world for which I think some vice chancellors still have a kind of nostalgia where it's sort of quiet chats in Whitehall corridors and, and being treated with respect by important politicians. It's a very different kind of world. Um, that universities don't present themselves. They're not elite institutions in that way. And of course they emphasize impact, engagement, not just in research, although that's very important, but also the idea of the civic university, the beacon institution, civic engagement more, more generally. Now that plays really well locally, but I'm not sure there's too much echo of that kind of stuff uh, nationally. Um, and then finally, of course, um, we present ourselves very much in, in, a, in, a, in, in terms of we don't, in higher education present much of a unified front. So there's an awful lot of divide and rule. I mean, there's the Russell group against other groups, mission groups, and of course the ultimate thing, league tables. Now, I think I share Nick's view about league tables that uh, I don't really think they're used very sensibly. On the other hand, you know, I mean, what, what's the option? Anyway, final thoughts. I mean, I think inevitably a lot of the action is gonna to switch to social media, which has this rather kind of parasitic and symbiotic relationship with the kind of what I call the conventional at the same time. Um, uh, and maybe the future, as I said, maybe with blogs as much as with more conventional forms of research, of, of reporting. Um, so maybe that's not a great scenario for higher education, but there it is and we have to learn to live with it. Anyway, thanks. Sorry, I went a bit over time. Yeah, that's all fine. Um, well, there's a lot there, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, Peter's laid down some challenges for both sides of the discussion. Media is tribal. Uh, media lacks resources. Um, social media is, uh, is going to take an increasing part of the action. Universities are, di are divided, fragmented. Their engagements are not effectively projected or reported. And there's that overriding, over sort of overhanging point that all big organisations are unpopular but maybe universities are more unpopular than some others. And I don't think we're quite sure why yet in this discussion that is the case. Um, Harriet Swan has the unenviable task of following five previous speakers. And thank you very much for coming on to the, the um, to enter the discussion, Harriet. Harriet's uh, specialization is research and she will have a lot to do we think in the next two or three weeks. Uh, with the possibility of large-scale UKRI cuts uh, resulting from 
uh, the uh, cost of Horizon Europe being visited on the normal research budget. Um, Harriet teaches journalism at the City University of London, but she's also had a period of doing work with Times Higher and with The Guardian prior to her current uh, work on research professional news. Harriet. Hello, and I hope um, I'm not here under false pretenses because although I work for, um, for uh, research professional news, I, I don't, I feel I'm more of a higher education policy journalist that rather than a research journalist. I think my fellow journalists on research professional news uh, would be much better at the, the research bit, although um, obviously I've been writing about research for for years um, and university policy. And I think um, with that sort of perspective, I thought it was quite interesting listening to the debate, um, remembering what it was like when I first started writing about universities in the sort of mid to late nineties on the Birmingham Post and Mail. Um, and when universities didn't really have press offices and you just ring up an academic and you'd say, um, you know, tell me about your research and they'd chat and it would take a while because they wouldn't have any idea what was newsworthy or interesting about their research and um, you you know find something interesting or not and then you'd write about it um, and they were completely sort of left to their own devices and then for a, a sort of short time after that there was a really horrible period when academics were told not really to speak to um, journalists and it was all sort of farmed out or a lot of it seemed to be farmed out to um, marketing companies off the premises who didn't really know how universities worked and um, certainly didn't know about individual academics research. Um, and then now it's it's obviously much slicker operations, um, some very good press officers around um, you get your stories sort of often nicely packaged academics themselves are much more sort of media savvy often doing their own social media and stuff um and so that's very different but what i would say what's happened over that time is there's been a definite breakdown in or not breakdown but shift in trust i suppose between academics and um and journalists much more sort of suspicion uh, of journalists and obviously um you know some of that is because of a lot of badly behaved journalists obviously present company accepted but you know journalists haven't haven't been their own best friends um and it's also obviously the marketization of higher education and they've got a lot more to lose by an academic kind of sounding off um being a bit of a loose cannon or they, they think they do anyway perhaps um and it's also because you know uh, the relationship between the media and um and a lot of organizations has shown that sort of similar sort of shift in interest. But I, I do think that higher education, the relationship between higher education and the media is, is a special case. Um, and I think that's, uh, there are a few reasons for that. I think, first of all, journalism and um, academia should both be on the same side. I mean, they're, they're both interested in questioning status quo, um, asking questions generally, uh, identifying problems, identifying solutions. Um, embracing new ideas um, and putting all this, as, as Anna mentioned, putting all about that above sort of self-interest and, and more corporate and financial considerations. I mean, I doubt whether most academics or journalists would go into it because they're interested in money, um, unless they're economists, I suppose. Um, but so they, they've, they've got a lot in common from that point of view. And that means they also have common enemies quite often, you know, questioning the status quo uh, doesn't go down well on the whole, um, or with, certainly with some um, people. Um, but it is something that uh, both want to preserve, it's in the interest of both to preserve that and, and sort of value it. Um, and then the other way I think that um, uh, research, uh, that academia and, and uh, or universities and, and the media uh, are a special case is because the research is highly specialized so you do need some kind of interpretation or translation for it and you know journalists um, are therefore specialist journalists in particular are, are very useful from that point of view they they know how to tell stories um, and so that's I think you know obviously sort of most um, you know a lot of sectors that kind of translation is important but I think it's particularly the, the case um, with with uh, within universities um, and and I think that means 
uh, academics being willing to engage with journalists as well for that. I mean, you can't complain about journalists getting things wrong um, uh, if you don't speak to them. So you do have to be prepared to, to do that. And, uh, you know, by the same token, journalists have to think about where they might need to compromise, you know, their, their, um, their timing, their demands um, in order to make sure that what they write about is accurate. Um, but it needs to be a two way relationship and and it needs to, um, you know, be a, a relationship of mutual respect to a certain um, point of view, but, you know, still with respecting what each does best. I mean, we're close, but we're not so close that we can't sort of criticize each other and, um, and that we're not different to each other. We're doing different jobs. Um, but I think the other way uh, in which universities and media uh, have things in common is that I think both should be ahead of the curve, that they should be shaping the debate rather than just responding to it. Um, and, uh, you know, that they should be uh, willing to, to do that. And I think universities sometimes are a little bit, as lots of the other speakers have mentioned, are less willing than they could be to do that. Um, and I think one area perhaps in this is the sort of international internationalization, um, which is, uh, you know, has always been sort of second nature to universities, it's part of what universities do, um, but it is quite um, alien sometimes to, uh, to other debates. And I think universities have been sometimes too ready to kind of talk about their um, international involvement in kind of economic and um, terms, financial terms, rather than as the sort of educational and cultural asset, huge asset that it is. Um, and that has, um, you know, that sort of came back to bite them, I think, a little bit in, um, in debates about immigration and Brexit. Um, and I think maybe they could have been leading the debate a bit more. I mean, obviously, there are some media that would never have listened to that, but there were lots of media that, that would have done. And I also think it's, um, it's a point that resonates a lot more with younger generations. Um, you know, so I, I think that we could have really picked up on, on that. Um, and, and so on that, actually, I think the other another way, it's slightly left field pointless, but um, universities and the media are also kind of have a, a, some kind of responsibility to students, both of them. Uh, universities obviously because it's, it's what they do but I think the media you know students aren't very experienced and haven't got much clout in asking questions and I think um, you know the media should be speaking up for um, for them or asking at least asking the questions that they want to ask so they should be asking things about comp compensation say for um, for the last year not at all to get at universities but because it is it's a valid issue that that needs addressing um, and you know, just on that, I mean, universe, uh, the media don't represent the public, I think, as, as other people have mentioned, but they do ask questions on their behalf. And I think that's quite an important distinction to make um, because that is, is to do with their skill set. They're not representative, um, but they are questioners. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's quite an important to, um, to bear in mind. Um, so, I mean, there's loads of questions being raised on this, I think. Um, Universities do have a responsibility to show what they're, they're doing for the public money they receive and journalists are a useful conduit for them to do that. Um, and they can get, because they can tell stories, they know how to tell stories. But I do think that um, universities do need to bear in mind that with those good news stories that journalists uh, can help them produce, they do have to kind of put up with some of the bad ones as well. I mean, it's like kind of celebrities um, you know, flogging their films with, you know, pictures of their lovely home, um, you have to take on board some of the sort of um, bad stuff as well. And it's natural for journalists to want to do that because they want to show the full picture. Um, and I think, you know, universities should embrace that kind of thing. I think they should be confident enough in themselves um, to engage fully. They've got an awful lot going for them. They've got an awful lot of public sympathy. You know, I know there's all this stuff about vice chancellor's pay and, and everything that people have been talking about, but there's also a huge kind of, you know, lots, uh, Nick, Nick's talked about this a lot, you know, people still want their kids to go to university. There are still lots of people want to go to university. It's seen as a generally good thing. You know, universities are in a strong position and should have, um, have confidence in what they're doing and how they're going about it and sort of invite scrutiny, I think, and put up and engage with it and, and sort of enjoy the intellectual challenge perhaps of scrutiny um, as, a, as a result of that. 
Um, maybe, maybe that's it. I mean, I, there's a, I think a, a certain amount of mistrust um, on both sides is maybe sensible for between the media and, um, and universities. Um, but, you know, it, also it's, it's sensible to recognize when journalists can and should be trusted to bring really important stories to light, such as this kind of the, um, the overseas development budget um, stuff that has been in the news um, recently. And, you know, that's a really important one to, to bring out there. And it's quite a complicated one, perhaps, um, but um, important to get out. So I think, you know, universities should, I agree with um, um, with uh, with Nick that um, that uh, you know, academics need to be better at behave perhaps on social media, um, but I I also um, agree that it's an important they they do need to engage with social media as well. You know, it's a, it's another form of scrutiny, and actually all sorts of scrutiny it should be a good thing. Um, and you know, just as the way just as the way with sort of peer review or with um, you know defending a thesis you expect some kind of criticism and it makes the work better it might be annoying but it makes the work better i think the uh, the same is true with the way that uh, that universities need to think about how they deal with the media i'll probably leave it there so there's a little bit time for questions thanks harriet um and really good that you brought up that point about journalists and academics have a lot in common i mean that's true i think that they're both in, in, engaged in a kind of critical and skeptical and creative relationship with knowledge and, and information. And um, yet the sensibilities are different, aren't they? I mean, journalists have got this relational view. They're always aware of how it affects everything else. Academics are often tunnel vision, often specialized. So there's a sort of deep, wide trade-off there. Now, we haven't got much time left. I'm surprised actually how we managed to use up the time. Uh, so what I'm going to do is bring in uh, a group of questions and then I think we'll probably take the response of the whole panel to the group of questions. I mean, we've had to use this bunching questions technique a lot in webinars because we have a lot of Q&A coming through and not much time to deal with it. So this is what we've found it works quite well. So, be, so you may not want to respond to all the questions. Um, and remember that we're going to start with Harriet and then work back to Anna when, when we get to the response stage. So the first uh, question comes from Johnny Rich. Johnny, are you still there? I am, yes, thank you. Um, it, Peter actually has addressed my question already quite a lot, and to some extent Anna has too. But uh, I wanted to pick up on the point Anna was making about the um, distinction between research, um, universities, to what extent the higher education sector is not presented as one sector in the media, but as two. There's the, there are the expert boffins doing the research, creating vaccines. And then there's the other sector where overpaid vice chancellors fleece um, woke students, um, her snowflakes. And um, is there a way of joining up the, the dots of these two versions of the sector? And in fact, presenting an, another version of the sector or other versions as well as economic hubs or as drivers of social mobility or um, providers of um, labor markets and so on. And whose, whose communication strategy is this? What is the communication strategy to do this? And whose is it? Thanks, Johnny. Um, Catherine, Catherine Montgomery. I am yeah, really enjoying the discussion. Thanks very much. And my question is, is a little bit along similar lines to Johnny's. Um, the, the media presents higher education as a, as a homogenous sector. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the COVID crisis has shown us that, that you know, we don't work together um, and that individual universities in, in a kind of vacuum from government guidance make decisions um, on their own. So, um, uh, my sort of slightly provocative question is, how would our journalist colleagues respond to being presented as a, a, as a, um, as a homogenous sector? So, you know, if, if it's exactly the same to be a, um, a Guardian journalist as it is to be a Sun or a Daily Star journalist, um, how, how, how would you respond to that construction of, of the media, you know, so that we can, perhaps higher education can learn from your responses to that? 
Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Alison, Alison Wheaton. Hi, thank you, Simon. Um, it seems to me that we've been touching on the role of media in a wider university stakeholder engagement strategy, which could obviously take place at lots of different levels. So it could be department, university, region, nation, um, global. And I'm curious if any of the speakers have any thoughts about at what level this might be best tackled and what actors might best take the lead. Thanks, Alison. Uh, Maria, Maria Ditchburn. Hi, everyone. Um, I think most of the panel members have already talked about how universities need to engage more effectively with media. But I suppose that the marketization of the sector makes this more difficult than it was before. Um, and I feel like institutions might feel like a bit of a lone voice now in that debate. So my question to the, to the panel then is to, to what extent might it improve universities' ability to challenge some of this current negative narrative? If they could find a way to develop more of a collective voice, which would work to sort of highlight the impactful work that they're doing um, and, and sort of, you know, challenge some of those um, attitudes. Thanks, Maria. Um, Solomon, Solomon Zawalde. Yes, yes, Simon, thank you. Um, thank you to all the panel. And my question is concerning media engagement with uh, students during the pandemic. Uh, I find that hugely disappointing uh, as an academic, also as a parent. I have a son uh, going to university as, uh, as first year. And I, I don't know what the problem is. I don't want to judge too much, but I, I, I would like to hear, you know, what are the problems from your point of view of not uh, doing enough or giving, you know, the platform, the voice for students? What are the problems for journalists to investigate the full impact of this pandemic? You, you know, you, you, I don't think people have uh, a proper understanding. We all don't have the proper understanding of the full impact of this pandemic on, on students. And uh, in your presentation, most of you touched, and I mean, focused a lot on this wrangling between university and government. I mean, none of the students' business as far as I'm concerned. And uh, the, the media is an already hard to reach organization for a certain, uh, you know, uh, section of, of, of the population for a certain diversity within the student population. So what are, what really are the problem to, you know, the students are abandoned by everyone. Okay, and you complained a lot about universities not engaging with you, not speaking to you. But I think students and parents are more forthcoming, more willing to, to speak to you and to engage with you. And you have a special power in your hands, because I've always believed Fighting from without higher education, okay, is uh, probably more likely to effect change than fighting from within, okay, which is uh, an extremely difficult task. And uh, I just want to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. I think a lot of us became aware when term one began this academic year that the mental health problems had really increased in the sector, and it's it's a it's a characteristic of those kinds of problems, and that was a shift in the student experience and an aggregate level. It's a characteristic of those kinds of problems that they're difficult to make into discussion topics because there's a private dimension to those issues. Um, but there was certainly something happening that wasn't being fully captured in the way the public discussion was, was, un was, was unfolding. Uh, and I think that's still the case with the pandemic. Um, Ryan Wilkinson is next. Hi, yeah, I've got a similar question to some points raised uh, already and something just to uh, carry on from what Maria asked and my experience as I'm sure the, is the experience of most other people working in higher education at the moment is that we tend to have like an overreach of uh, management power structures whatever it's kind of uh, how you want to refer to that coming into our everyday lives in terms of interfering with the teaching that we do interfering with the research that might be being conducted and that and i think a lot of that is down to this kind of real nervousness about getting negative press and reflecting badly on the institution that then has an impact on you know student satisfaction or student perceptions that has an impact on budgets etc cetera, etc cetera. and we can call that marketization as a lot of the panel already have done and i just wondered and I don't mean to be um, critical of the panel or journalists or media in any way. This is just kind of provoca a provocation. How 
how much is the other side of that debate, particularly given from those working within higher education on the ground, against that marketization doctrine and against those pernicious force, forces that really have an impact on our work. It seems to me that a lot of the coverage that, that is given about universities is really framed within this like marketization doctrine of what is good and what is bad. Thank you. Well, well thanks. Thanks uh, to all of the questioners. And it's quite a formidable list of points, I think. Um, I'm sorry, Gabriel um, Alfaro, I'll have to um, go straight to the panel given the time factor. And our first response from the panel will be from Harriet Swain. Harriet. Harriet. Um, okay. Just, and to try and be succinct because we've only got a minute or two. I, I will really. deal. I'll, I'll just pick up on a, a couple of ones. One is the um, the point about students, which I think is um, is very true. Um, it is quite difficult to uh, to to pick up on what's exactly happening to students because every student's experience will be very different. I mean, journalists do their best to try and find case studies and so on, but um, what you I mean, the NUS does good work, but you do depend very much on representative um, bodies in order to get a full kind of picture. I mean, the, the journalists are always very worried about being anecdotal, um, sort of picking out something and giving too much um, emphasis on, on something which is just only affects one person. So it, yeah, it, it's, it's a problem and it's, it's difficult to get to. And it depends on the sort of strength of representative bodies and um, on, 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 on students sort of speaking up. And as I've said, you know, it is difficult with students because they're inexperienced and they're sort of um, worried about it and uh, so yeah it's a problem and I think it's a very very fair point and, and needs to we need to work out you know some way of, of doing that better probably. Um, the other point about the collective voice and actually uh, in a way that is a sort of some picked up on the point of uh, being a homogenous sector I mean actually I think uh, okay, most of us, um, I mean, I've certainly worked for all diff sorts of different publications. I know other journalists have as well. I mean, across, across the board, you don't want to be lumped in, um, maybe if you work for The Guardian with The Daily Mail, but actually I've worked for both. Um, and uh, there are certain um, things that, that uh, you know, we're, I'm trained for and that we, uh, our skills will be similar for both, even though, you know, what we're being told to do isn't the same. And I think the same is probably true in universities, that there are certain, um, uh, there are certain sort of experiences that are common to both. And I think that, yes, a collective voice is needed, a better collective voice picking up on those common points um, between all sorts of different um, universities across the sector is definitely uh, needed. If we run a minute or two over time, it's not the end of the world. Um, Peter Scott. Um, thanks. I'll just pick up a couple of points. I mean, first of all, Johnny's point, I think it's, it's, it's a really good way of thinking of it, that there some, seem to be two universities. There's a kind of good university, which is research. Uh, you want your kids to go to that. And of course, that's why you know, more means worse is, is a non-starter effectively, because the threat, that's all very good. And then there's this kind of bad university, which is sort of overpaid vice chances, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a sort of strange disconnect there, which is quite difficult to understand. I mean, after all, we don't say that about in the health sector, do we? We don't say doctors and nurses are great, but hospitals are bad. I mean, so what's going on there? And I think that, that somehow making, bringing that kind of getting rid of that disconnect and giving universities more of a credit for actually what they're doing because they're providing all this stuff. Uh, and that links just finally to the kind of point, the collective voice point. Now, I mean, there's you know, I mean, lots of debate about how, how successful or unsuccessful U Universities UK has been over the years, um, but it's certainly been undermined by the kind of uh, in prominence of mission groups now. But again, if you make the comparison with health, I mean, you've got something, an overall brand called the National Health Service, and this is the brand that's projected. So you don't have within that brand, you don't have, um, you know, acute hospitals trashing GP surgeries. I mean, you know, although there's a massive diversity within the healthcare system, there seems to be a common voice. And to some extent, that's a structural thing, because we have something called the National Health Service. We don't have the National University Service, and I'm not proposing we should have, but that's a kind of problem, I think. Thanks, Peter and Debbie. I'm uh, I'm struggling to know which 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 
which point to pick up there's so many. Um, I've addressed Maria's and in, 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 uh, I, dis I disagree that, that, that a collective voice is actually the, the, the answer here. I think actually you, you get sort of bluntness um, when you try and kind of speak on behalf of all universities everywhere. And, and I think the um, UK have worked really hard and, and, you know, and done some really good work on that and it, and it hasn't worked. So I think, I think you know, try something different. I think that also perhaps speaks to um, Alison's questions about kind of where do these things sit um, and, and, you know, and how, how do you implement this in strategy? I think there's something here that is less about saying, let us, you know, polish our techniques um, and, uh, and is more about saying what are the kind of values that we espouse across the institution and how do we you know, infuse that across all our practice because then we need to be less worried I think about um, uh, you know there will, there will inevitably be kind of gaffes and, and, and failures and, and, and moments of kind of ludicrousness but it, you know if, if the kind of overall uh, mission of the university is kind of aligned to the public value and, and everyone's kind of working on that basis, then you, you need not worry quite so much about kind of protecting your reputation, um, perhaps arguably, I guess. Um, and I think, you know, Ryan, you're, you're, you're right that marketization has created this kind of really quite uh, difficult, I mean, I think universities were really concerned about their reputation before marketization really kicked in. I think what's changed now in media, and this is where I kind of disagree with you, is, is that journalists, and this is kind of Rosie Bennett's point in her happy paper, is that journalists are now more concerned about students because they're paying, and that's why it's become a consumer story, which is not, it's not the same as journalists saying, you know, we are pro-marketization and we think this is marvelous. So it's less about representing both sides of that debate and more about saying, well, given that students are paying, these are their concerns, their parents are the ones reading our papers, so that's where our kind of in, that's where our interest lies as individuals. Um, and I would, I think, you know, on Monkey, we're we're a bit more able to kind of try and kind of, you know, unpack some of the different uh, as aspects of that. And then finally, on students, um, the great thing, of course, about and and, and happy, of course, too. And Nick will no doubt cite some stuff that he's got coming out this week, which which we what of already. Um, uh, we can do things like research the student experience and 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 kind of bring to light some of those voices, and we, and, and we do that an awful lot. So uh, we've we've mm -hmm. done some work with Pearson this year, um, and working in partnership with students unions, uh, trying to bring to light what the experience has been and try and bring recommendations to universities. Uh, I know I know uh, Nick, Nick's Nick's team at Happy have has, has, have been have been doing work similarly. So uh, you know, and, and and of course, any student who wanted to could, in theory, pitch us a piece. Uh, that 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 is, I think, easier said than done, but. Um, Lots, yeah, lots of this is about kind of, uh, you know, people, people using their voices as well as it is about journalists chasing them down. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, and Nick. Thank you, Simon. Uh, rather than going through all the points, because there isn't time, I'm just going to try and bring all the questions together. And please forgive me for this, because I'm going to make myself very unpopular, but it's probably easier for me to say this than for the, the journalist. A lot of the questions were quite whingy. You know, why aren't we portrayed like this? Why aren't we portrayed like that? And I've got to say, I think we make our own weather. You know, it's up to us to tell the stories about our sector. And it's up to us to tell the stories about our sector in a really engaging way. That the, and I'm not claiming journalism is perfect in any way, but, you know, HEPI gets as much publicity as it does. We're only a four person organization uh, uh, because universities are slow to pick up the phone. They give boring answers to questions from journalists. Uh, you know, they're not always out and about the way they might be. And I really do think that 50% of the answer here is in us making sure the stories and the way that we talk to journalists are interesting and engaging. Thank you for inviting me again. Hard to disagree, Nick, I have to say. Um, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, again, I'll just try to pick up on a couple of points. I, I do think it's interesting, this sort of relationship between research and the wider reputation of the universities. And perhaps coming back to that, I, I agree that bringing them together and sort of playing them off against each other is, is challenging. I, I think there's a, a part here that we may be missing, that there's a sort of third element which we haven't talked about, which is university's civic role. And this is perhaps something that involves media the, the media sort of they're on this call a bit a bit less and i'm not necessarily saying it's about local newspapers either but it's about universities engaging directly with their uh, local communities um, i think prior to the brexit vote i think universities were guilty of neglecting that local role at the sort of ch chasing sort of global status um and i think if universities are thinking about their reputation and how they're portrayed um, focusing very hard on sort of their role as um, employers, as role as sort of solvers of problems for their local communities um, is, a, is a key area where they're going to sort of 
have 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 a more sort of fruitful time. In in terms of you know which groups, I think there's a question from Alison about who should lead on building a strong relationship. I entirely echo what Nick says um, that you know actually if um, people sort of engage with universities, they can get lots of coverage and very positive coverage. I think there's a real role for heads of comms, um, for pro vice chancellors, for vice chancellors, for for senior academics as well, and indeed for you know people across the whole of academia to uh, engage with academic, engage with journalists. Journalists are really keen to build direct personal relationships, to build trust in those relationships. And uh, they, they genuinely can make um, a significant difference to the, to the way um, the sex is portrayed in the media. Um, finally, to, to Ryan's point, which uh, was, a, was a very good one and one, not one that I have a sort of a straight answer to, or certainly a, a, cl a clear answer to at this stage. I mean, I think our role as journalists, we're sort of asking legitimate questions of universities. We want to make universities better by asking these questions. And I think we do highlight many of the problems of marketization in our coverage. If you look at sort of some of the coverage we've done at THE on staff and academic and PhD mental health, I think we do um, highlight those challenges. Um, so I think, you know, the questions we ask are difficult and legitimate. Often I think, you know, there's questions to be asked about the way universities respond to those questions as well as the questions that we ask. And finally, Anna. Uh, you might be muted, Anna. Right. Okay, I'm going to have to talk even faster now. Is that better? Um, Catherine, you asked, would we all like to be lumped in together? Absolutely not. I'd be deeply offended if you um, thought of me as like a CERN journalist. Um, or, um, uh, but I don't actually see universities as, as one big homogenous lump. I try to talk to people from different sorts of universities. But I will fess up and say that I think that news desks are more interested in views coming from the hallowed Russell Group, although we do, of course, all know that even within the Russell Group, there's a lot of variety and not everybody in the Russell Group is quite as brilliant as they're supposed to be. Um, but there is a way around that, I think, which is that journalists are busy creatures and will naturally come back to anybody who was good last time they talked to them. So it doesn't really matter what your university you're at. If you were good, you had interesting things to say, journalists will come back to you. They're not going to be too snobby about the fact that you don't work with Simon at the University of Oxford. Um, and then finally, I'd just like to disagree um, about the, um, I don't think students have been ignored during the pandemic. I think they've actually had quite a lot of coverage. Um, I found social media really useful in tracking down students to speak to about the um, how angry or upset they're feeling about what's been going on. Um, students are good at using social media for that purpose. I think that possibly what you're really getting at here is that students are being part of the story, but it's not having any effect. I think that is what's really upsetting them. So they are getting their story out there over and over again. Look at us. We're miserable what's going on we never thought it would be like this please help should we be paying this much and then there's a resounding silence in response so i think that's what they're feeling angry about um and i'll stop there thank you very much this has been really um thought-provoking yeah i think it's been really valuable i mean i really appreciate the way the panels approach this and the way you were able to i think um heroically make new points, each of you, after so many had been already said so well already. Um, but, but the seriousness of the discussion has been really helpful. And I'm, I know you would have liked more interchange in the Q&A. Um, I thought that if we had 90 minutes, we'd have half an hour of Q&A, but there's a sort of iron law at work there that, you know, talk expands to fill the time available. Um, <laughs> so that's, and we find this always with, with webinars that we always end up with less discussion than we really want. Um, what I've what I've taken away from this is is that that resonant point that Debbie made about universities engaging directly with the public uh, and beefing up their comms capacity and not just simply thinking in terms of a surreptitious relationship uh, with policymakers but focusing directly on communication uh, and we have so much scope so many good people so much capacity professional and if you like gifted amateurish 
to do that well. Um, so really no excuse. We should be in the forefront of communications. Um, that's what the higher education world is now, I think. It's a highly relational and communicative world. Look, thank you all for your participation. Really, really, really um, grateful that you could come on. And we hope that you'll stay engaged with us in our webinars as they unfold, as they do many different topics, many different locations, different voices twice a week. Our next webinar is not till after Easter. And that's uh, a Than Palm from Monash University in Australia, one institution I worked for a long time ago, who's going to talk about international students and um, labor markets, navigating the labor markets, international graduates need more than just credentials. So we'll look forward to seeing our regulars and others then um, just after Easter. And again, thank you very much to the panel today. Bye for now. Thank you.